Yeah. Uh, stop share. Did that work? That worked. Okay. So you're going to let me know when to share my screen again? Hi, everyone. As you're joining, as always, please share with us in the chat where you're joining from uh, today. What do you do? What are you hoping to learn during this session? And we'll begin shortly. Hi, Tasmin from Kenya. Uh, Shahida, please make sure you select everyone, not just hosts and panelists. So we have Shahida from Angola, Sabrina from Tanzania. Malik from Pakistan. Gosh, it's going fast. Germany, the US, Madagascar, India, Gloria from Ghana, Susan from Australia. Welcome, guys. We have everyone with us Geneva, Rwanda, Sri Lanka. Amazing. Nigeria. Well, welcome everyone. So we'll get started because we want to get started and we're going to get into the content. So as people are joining, please continue to share. Hi, Sarah. Um, and uh, we are excited to dive into theme five. Guys, now we are more than halfway done the masterclass series. Um, <coughs> And of course, you can find all the recordings, everything on the website. Uh, today is on mixed methods and evaluating complicated and complex systems change. Um, as always, this is part of the masterclass series that's been co-curated by NORC uh, with Meg Hargreaves and Ekdan. Uh, and this series is part of our broader systems thinking initiative that is supported by Porticus, and we do it in partnership with, in fact, Aisha at Harvard. Next. Um, we have four pillars to the initiative, systems research, systems investing, systems measurement, systems design and implementation, and we have a lot of activities across those pillars, but this series is particularly under the measurement pillar. As always, to complete the certificate, remember you need to complete at least seven out of 14. They don't need to be live sessions. Complete the survey after the session is complete. You can do it during, but just not before sessions are started as some have been doing. Next. Um, and of course, after each masterclass, you will have access to everything. Everything is on the website, including the recordings, including the presentations, including the resources. And you can continue the conversation on ECD Connect as well. So the format um, is usually welcome and introductions as we're doing now, the masterclass session, the dialogue with the early childhood expert and a participant Q&A. So be sure to put in your questions in the Q&A box. Um, you can vote for questions. That's a really helpful. So if someone else has already asked a question you're really interested in, please do vote for it because that will help us prioritize questions. Um, and finally, I think everyone's doing it. To chat, please select everyone and feel free to share resources in the chat and you know connect with each other. That's where we want to get connected. Finally, if you need Spanish translation, please go to interpretation and select Spanish. Again, huge thank you to UNICEF Black Road for sponsoring the Spanish translation. And finally, we're so excited to dive, take a deep dive into session number nine um, under uh, Johnny Morell's um, guidance today. He, let me introduce him to you. He's an organizational psychologist with extensive experience in the theory and practice of program evaluation. His current research and evaluation focuses on how knowledge from complexity science can be applied to models, methods, and metrics as those contracts are used in the field of evaluation. He has been recognized by the American Evaluation Association um, who have awarded him their Paul Lazar Spelt Evaluation Theory Award. He's the editor in chief emeritus of the journal Evaluation Program Planning. Um, 
And of course, Aisha needs no introduction, but she's going to be our early childhood expert today. Uh, professor Aisha Yusuzai, she's a professor of child development and health at Harvard University. Um, her research focuses on developing new interventions and approaches to promote early childhood development, focusing on how to strengthen child and caregiving related outcomes through existing health, nutrition, and education systems. Her research also seeks to understand the implementation structures and processes for early childhood interventions for sustainable impact at scale. In addition, her research seeks to promote capacity development in local communities, services, and systems for delivery of interventions to promote effective and high quality early childhood development. All right, and the next one, next class starts in half an hour. If you haven't registered for that, please do. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Johnny and Aisha. Okay, so... How do I do this? I'm using your slides. You can bring up that screen, Daddy. Oh, okay. So I can. Am I looking at your? Whose screen am I looking at now? I guess I'm confused. Well, let's try it. People can hear me. I'm assuming. Okay. Hello, everybody, and thank you for being willing to listen to me. I hope that by the time this is over you'll agree that your time was well spent. Uh, let me start by giving you an overview of, my, of the plan here. We're gonna go through one, two, three, four, five uh, stages here, if we get to all of them. If we don't, that's okay. I'd rather that we go more slowly and a little bit more in depth than rushing through to get all this done. Uh, but here's the way we're gonna do this. I'm gonna give you a brief overview of complexity. Uh, that's going to talk about issues of randomness and predictability and a little bit on the intellectual history of the field of complexity science. Uh, then we're going to talk about some complex system behaviors that should matter to us. And when I say matter to us, what I mean is that when we do evaluation, at least when I do evaluation, I think in terms of three concepts, I think of models, not necessarily model, logic models, but all inquiry has a model. Uh, and I think of methodologies used to query those models and, of course, data and data interpretation. And we certainly don't believe that models have to be consistent throughout an evaluation. In fact, they shouldn't be because presumably as data comes in, you're going to have some insight about what the models are and you should change them. Uh, then we're going to talk about how to evaluate a complex system. And the basic lesson here, frankly, is that we already know what to do. Uh, part of the problem with complexity is that it sounds difficult. Now, it might be a little bit strange and it might be a little bit counterintuitive, but in terms of evaluating complex systems, for the most part, we know what to do. Uh, and it's just a question of figuring out how to apply it. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, then we're going to talk about when you should apply complexity and when you shouldn't. You know, uh, they say that if you give a little boy a hammer, he'll describe, he'll decide that everything within reach needs pounding. Uh, and certainly complexity is my nail and I like to pound it. But it is also true uh, that we're in the business of, is the business we have is getting good enough answers to help decision makers make good decisions. And that often involves not thinking in terms of complexity. Uh, and then finally, we will talk about evaluating transformation if we get that far. Uh, and we're going to do that because transformation uh, is, in fact, often a complex system. And I know that many of the people here are interested in transformation. So we'll see how far that gets to. The first thing I want to talk about is, is where we are intellectually uh, and epistemologically in terms of what a complex system is. Uh, and here you see what looks like a graph. I'd very much like to tell you that I was smart enough to come Johnny, up with this graph. Um, yes. Just to say, we, I can't see your screen. So I think we should just pause for a second. Just you can't to, see my screen. Share your slides. Uh, I thought I was doing that, but hang on. Let me end the show. Um, here, hang on a minute. So I need, so I should be sharing my screen. I thought we were doing that. But if we're not, we'll do it now. All right, let me know if that's working. Are we good? We can see your screen. All we right. just need to see the slides. That's coming right up. 
So that was the plan that I talked about. Now we're going to talk a little bit. You can see the picture now, correct? You can see the picture. All right, let me uh, get into slide view. Perfect. Thank you. That, um, that worked. Brilliant. I don't know why it has that fancy transition, by the way. I didn't tell it to do that. But in any case, so here we are. Uh, and as I said, I'd like to, I'd very much like to tell you that I came up with this picture, but it's not true. You can see the reference down here. Uh, it's a very interesting lecture on what complexity is. In any case, here's the way, a good, here is one good way to think about what a complex system is. It's a rather strange graph, but let me talk you through this. On the x-axis, we go from, not we go from, there are regions, there's a region, region that is low predict, low random and high predictability. And here are a couple of examples, right? One are kids in a playground, right? There's nothing random about this and it's highly predictable. Put a kid near a playground, you know where they're going to go. Uh, if you want to be more uh, uh, more mathematical about it, more physical about it, you can think about the orbits of planets. But in both cases, right, there's nothing random about this, and it's very highly predictable. At this side here on the lower right, we have a situation where it's still highly predictable, but it's also highly random. And the best example here are the gas laws, right? If you, you have um, uh, and you have pressure, uh, you have temperature, volume, I forget what the third variable is, but if you have one, I can give you the other two, uh, the other one. If I have two, you can give you the other one. So that means that it's highly predictable. But if you think about it, each molecule in that volume of gas is moving around randomly. That's what statistical mechanics are all about. So we have a phenomenon where it's highly predictable, but also highly random. We live in this world here. Right, and I have a couple of images to be a sort of a government and an economy and an ecology. These are all situations where things are medium random, right? I mean, the world we live in is really somewhat predictable. Um, and so, well, it's not, I don't mean high predictability. It's medium random, this should say medium predictability, but I'll teach you. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. How do we go back? How do I go back? There we, this should say medium random, medium predictability. That should teach me not to change slides before the presentation. But this is the world we live in, right? Where things are reasonably predictable, uh, but not very predictable. And they're random and not totally random. And when we talk about complex systems, this is where the world we live in. And this whole complexity science thing has a huge intellectual history behind it. And I promise not to talk about this. And if anybody was in Emily Gates' session, she used this as well. And I only want to show this to you to give you a sense that people like Emily and I are not making this up, that there really is a deep intellectual history to complexity science. And enough said about that. Before we get into any details, let me tell you what one of the class exercises is going to be. We are going to be talking about complex behavior. Uh, and what I would like people to do is to begin to filter and apply what it is they're going, they're going to be hearing against something in their professional lives where they're either doing an evaluation or thinking about an evaluation or planning a program or planning a policy. But what I would like people to do is to try to apply what I'm saying to some real event in their lives. Uh, and the reason I set this up now instead of later is to set you up to do that kind of thinking. So th that having been said, let me start out by saying that I actually try hard not to talk about complex systems, despite this nice picture here. And the reason I don't like to talk about complex systems is that I don't know what to do with it. Uh, if you tell me that there is a complex system, it doesn't help me build a model, and it doesn't help me design a methodology, and maybe it'll help me interpret data, but I think probably not. So knowing that a system is complex might be true, but not very useful. But if I know how a complex system behaves, I know what it does. And by knowing what it does, I can 
build models and develop methodologies and interpret data. So what we're gonna be doing is talking not about complex systems, but about the behavior of complex systems. Now that can make a very long list, but what I'm really gonna talk about is five behaviors of complex systems that in my experience are useful for doing evaluation. Uh, and I'm gonna spend some time talking about this and what I would like is for people now to start thinking about how they might apply some of these to their work. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, down the left, these things are in order of character string and not order of importance. Uh, I found in my life, if I don't have a reason to put things in a particular order, better to put them alphabetically or in character string length so that it's clear to people that there really is no reason to order them in any particular way. So that's just sort of the way I like to do things. So the first concept is stigmagy. Uh, and one of the ways to think about stigmagy is bottoms up control. Uh, actually, I don't mean that. Bottoms up pattern development, uh, where, uh, where each individual actor sees what is in front of it and makes a decision. And what comes out of that is a pattern. This actually is a concept that came out of insect behavior. You can think about that in terms of beehives, uh, for instance. But you can think about it in terms of the human world as well. I mean, for instance, some scientist uh, publishes a paper uh, that is particularly enlightening to the rest of the community. Uh, and people begin to look at that paper and base their research on that paper. Uh, and soon enough, the uh, National Science Foundation in the US is asking for research grants based on what that scientist has found. And if you come back five years later, you see that there's a whole trend in science that's developing. You think someone must have planned that, right? It's too much of a pattern someone must have planned that when in fact nobody planned it. Uh, and I'm sure you can see that a lot in the worlds you live in where something happens, independent decisions are made, that is built upon and all of a sudden, however much later, it looks as if there's a pattern when in fact there is no central control. This happens all the time. And of course, if you're planning programs and you're thinking about change and how people react to the services that they're receiving, you can easily see how Unexpected changes, however small, will build upon themselves. And this happens all the time. And I think one of the problems uh, in planning and an evaluation is that what looks like pattern is in fact the bottoms up behavior. And if you wanna understand how a program works and what effects it's gonna have, you really want some sense of whether it's this sort of stigmergic kind of independent behavior that develops into a pattern versus something that somebody made happen. So that's the one example that happens a lot. The other is emergence. And this is something that we've actually, you know, this is probably the one concept that I'm sure you've heard about. What it really means is that the whole is qualitatively different than the sum of its parts. And the key word here is qualitative, because what it means is that you cannot measure that phenomenon simply by knowing what's going into it. And that has a couple of consequences. It has a practical consequence of measurement, right? Because if we're gonna measure something that is qualitatively different than what went before, then obviously I need some kind of new metric or some kind of new way of, observe, of observing it. But more important than that, it has consequences, oh, and it has consequences for methodology. Because if you think about things like process tracing, if you run into, where you, uh, which is a methodology where you sort of looking at what happened and tracing a causal path, essentially, or a lot of methodologies that more or less get at that way of looking at the world. Uh, if you hit a outcome, for instance, that is qualitatively different than anything that went before it, you need to think a little bit differently about what it means to have a causal change. Uh, most importantly, though, over and above the question of methodology is program theory, right? Because what we're saying here is, that if A, B, and C happen simultaneously, as an example, right, that D is going to be different than what went before it. Uh, and that is an issue not just of this practical matter of measurement or causal pattern recognition, but it's a matter of, uh, of program theory, that there is a qualitative change. So that's what emergence is all about. 
state change is a sudden change from one set of conditions to another, right? And I'm sure you've all, I hope you've all seen situations where nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens, and all of a sudden the world you're living in looks different in terms of the what's happening to the recipients of your services or to the social policies that you're trying to implement, uh, change, or in terms of the civic society that you're trying to have an effect on, or, uh, or, or the community behavior that you're trying to have an effect on, where all of a sudden, there's a sudden change, right? That doesn't happen because you forgot to measure intermediate change. It happens because the nature of the world is such that these kinds of sudden changes explain the behavior of the world, essentially, for, the, for what it is that you're measuring. Again, this has implications, practical implications for um, methodology, obviously. It has practical implications for expectations of change. We all like to think, gee, let's look at what we're doing. Maybe we haven't gotten as far as we wanted, but we can figure out whether we've gotten halfway to where we wanted to go or some kind of partial change. But if your program theory says nothing is going to happen, nothing is going to happen, nothing is going to happen, and then quite a lot is going to happen, uh, there are obvious issues of program theory, uh, there are issues of methodology, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's what state change is all about. Now we have sensitivity conditions. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard about the butterfly effect. Uh, I have to tell you I hate the butterfly effect. In fact, I have a section on my website where I have a picture of a butterfly and a uh, red line going through it is in Ben the butterfly. Uh, and the reason is that if you look at the definition, small changes can change the trajectory of a system. And that is true. And it's particularly true if you look at, the, if you sort of trace causal paths in retrospect, you can often see how small changes have changed the entire trajectory of a system. Uh, the problem is that when you do that kind of methodology, the small changes that you detect are, in fact, the ones that have made a big difference. Otherwise, you wouldn't detect them. The fact of the matter is that small change almost never has an effect. Uh, butterflies flapping their wings in South America do not cause hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and most, if you think about it um, in, a, in an ecological sense, a biological sense, um, we have genetic changes, we have mutations all the time. Almost none of them make a difference. So it is true that sensitivity to conditions can make a big difference. And it's very often when you study phenomena and do back casting and, and process tracing and what have you, you will find small changes that have made a, changes that have made a big difference. So in terms of understanding why things happen and program theory, you have to be aware of the fact that small changes can make, make a difference. Uh, but don't go thinking that all small changes are going to change the world because the vast majority of them don't. We do have a stable world after all. Uh, and finally, we have this notion of attractors and self-organization. Uh, and the notion of attractors, if you think about it as a normal or an equilibrium state, right? And I'm sure that and, and this notion of attractors is explains both resistance to change and sustainability of new change. Uh, so one is the evil twin of the other, and depending on your point of view, which one is the evil twin kind of depends. But the point is that there are equilibrium conditions that are very difficult to change. Uh, and that is because any perturbation, any push, of that system away from its equilibrium is gonna more or less result in nothing happening. It's gonna sort of bounce around a bit and come back to its equilibrium. And anybody who's ever changed the healthcare system or educational system knows quite well how powerful the attractor states are for all kinds of institutions, right? So that's this notion of an attractor. You can think of it almost as a topographical map where if something is in a deep valley, it's gonna be very difficult to change if it's in a shallow depression, it's going to be easier to change. But if you drop the system into that area, it's going to roll down into its attract. That's the notion of an attractor. And I, I find that very useful because it helps the shape of those attractors helps me understand similarities and differences across different programs. Um, 
And then we have self-organization. Those are the dynamics that drive the attractor. And what self-organization really means is that the system can get, I have to be careful because I'm talking, I'm, I'm reifying this as if systems think and they don't. But it's as if the system is pushed around from the outside and it can figure out for itself how to get back to its equilibrium behavior, its equilibrium state. That's what self-organization is all about. And you can think of self-organization in terms of relationships amongst parts of a system. You can think of it in terms of feedback loops. There are all kinds of ways of thinking about the dynamics of self-organization. But basically what happens is you have a system uh, that exists in some attractor state. If you push it around, it'll figure out by itself how to get back. So there are many, many ways of thinking about complex, uh, complex systems and complexity science. But these issues, these five concepts are, at least in my experience, are the ones that are most useful when I look at evaluating a program or when I look at designing a program. Uh, we have stigma G, which basically means it's a bottom up kind of pattern emergence, which happens all the time in, in programs that I've dealt with, where you think that someone planned to change, because surely a change like that wouldn't happen by itself. And in fact, it happened by itself in the sense that each individual decision-making entity sees what happened immediately before it and then makes a decision. And again, I have to be careful because I'm talking as if these things think and they don't, but they act as if they think, and that's a good way to talk about it. Uh, we talk about emergence, which basically is a qualitatively different change. Uh, and as I said, that has implications for program theory and for methodology. Uh, state change has to do with the sudden state. If you think about attractors down here, you can think about a state change as suddenly moving from one attractor to another without much in the way of intermediate change. Uh, and I'm sure we've all seen that. Sometimes it's planned, sometimes it isn't planned, but it happens a lot. And it has implications, as I said, for program theory and for methodology. Sensitivity to conditions matters because small changes really can change the entire trajectory of a system. Uh, and this is particularly important when you have, when you're looking back on a program and you say to yourself, what happened? How did we get here? And when you do that, you're probably going to find some set, set of conditions that no one ever expected to make a difference that have affected the entire trajectory of the system. Uh, it's an important concept. As long as you don't go overboard and think all small changes make a difference, the fact is that the vast, vast majority of, of small changes do not make a difference. And then we have this notion of attractors and self-organization. Attractors are the equilibrium state. You can think of them, as I said, in terms of topographical maps, right? The deeper the valley, the harder it is to move things, right? And then self-organization, which has to do with the internal dynamics by which the system, again, I have to be careful, figures out how to bring itself to its equilibrium state. Systems don't figure anything out, but it's hard to talk about this without reifying. So that's what we're doing. Okay, we are going to get to the class exercise in a minute, but I want to make this point as well. I've talked about stigma G and I've talked about emergence and I've talked about state change and sensitivity to conditions and, and attractors and self-organization. And I've done it as if each one is independent of the other. And you can tell already that they're not because you're probably asking yourselves questions about sort of the relationship of stigma tree to attractors. And in fact, there are quite a few ways of thinking about the connections between these concepts, but it's very difficult to explain them if you start out by assuming that there are interactions amongst them. But beyond that, one of the things that complexity is about, for lack of a better word, is about pattern and about predictability and about how change happens. And you can see how I've sort of touched on those issues so far. And so one of the ways to think about these five concepts is I am designing an evaluation. What do these concepts tell me about my program theory, 
and what do these concepts tell me about the methodology that I'm implementing, and what do these concepts tell me about how I interpret data. But what is also true is that you can think about pattern and predictability and about how change happens, and you can either think about it in terms of each one of these or combinations of these, but whichever way you choose to think about it, one of the things, the story they tell, maybe that's the way to think about this, the story they tell is a pattern and predictability in how change happens is very often not the common sense way we think about causation and change. So having said all that, we have here a class exercise, which we're not going to be able to do in terms of people coming on and talking, like too many people have, have a small group here. And so if you would be interested in doing this, please put some of the responses in the chat. Please tell us about a planning or evaluation scenario where any of these complex behaviors are operating. But as we do that, and as you're thinking about that, we have a poll to conduct. And whoever's going to push the poll conduct button is going to do that. Oh, do I need to get out of my... Oh, there it is. Okay, good. Do you suspect that any of these complex behaviors are operating in programs that you're funding, designing, or evaluating? Oh, be still my beating heart. I am very pleased to hear all that. What? Someone disagrees. Okay, but the point is that, th that this is true, right? Uh, and on an intuitive level, everybody knows that this is true, right? You might not have had the vocabulary for it. You might not have had the sort of intellectual structure for it, but nobody's escaped this, uh, except maybe the 7% of the people. 7% of you have escaped this, 93% have not. Uh, what I'm trying to do now is to give you a, a conceptual understanding, an intellectual book to say, this weird stuff happens, now I can do something with it. Um, I don't, did we have a second question? I believe we did. No, oh, just a second. No, this is the first, okay, good. So that having been said, uh, I can't see the chat, right? But but you can. Uh, are there questions here that I should be addressing? Oh, there's a second question. Do you suspect that any of these complex behaviors have noteworthy consequences that the programs you're funding, designing, and evaluating. The reason I put this here is that it's one thing to say it happens. It's another thing to say it matters, right? And it's really this second question that's important. And sure enough, you're all wise enough to see that it does have noteworthy differences, right? And it's the noteworthy that matters because it affects funding decisions, it affects the design of programs, it affects the way in which evaluation is done, it affects the way in which recommend, as an evaluator, I don't like to make recommendations, uh, but it affects the way in which evaluators try to explain to their clients and to their stakeholders why these things matter so and maybe suggest what they should do about it. So, Johnny, could I yes. ask you a question just to clarify Please. a couple of points that have emerged in the Q&A? Sure. Um, so just to give a scenario, if I'm working with home visitors and they have been trained to do a weekly visit to a new mother, mm -hmm. to work with her, to help her support her young baby, Mm -hmm. Probably some feeding advice, some sleep advice, development care sure. advice. Sure. And then the pandemic happens. Right. And suddenly those home visits can't happen and okay. switch to phones. And the home visitor is suddenly dealing with feeling like the advice I'm trained to give is not useful because the mother's isolated, she's lonely, she's stressed. There are other things that I need to respond to. And that might not have been in the original theory of change. It might not be what we were thinking of measuring. But would this be the sorts of complex behaviors now that the system is yeah. presenting us with that we need mm -hmm. to think, let's pause 
and let's try to understand what's happening and how we sure. um how we plan around this now the answer is yes uh and the answer also implies that if i had thought about it i would have added another complex system behavior here um maybe i'll change this later uh, but you've all heard of the black swan effect right what that you know every, nobody knew there were black swans until i found one uh, but the point is what the real question is is what is the likelihood that some event will come about that will have an important change on your program okay now good planners can determine likely events uh, that may happen that will affect their program. My favorite example is the state of the economy, for instance. We have some program that implies a certain uh, level of um, economic vitality so that people can, can earn money and, and go into business and what have you. And any good planner would say, we're going to assume that maybe the economy will tank. And if that happens, what are we going to do? So that's an example where a likely change can be determined in advance, can be foreseen in advance. But it's also true that there are many, many, many events which are unlikely enough that you would never um, that you would never um, identify them in a planning process. But given that there are so many of these low probability events, the probability is high that something is going to happen. Uh, and that actually is an important complex system behavior, which I'm going to add the next time I do this presentation. But the point is, that's a complex behavior. Uh, now, in terms of how you would deal with that, uh, I don't see that as a complex system problem so much as a flexibility of a planning and an evaluation problem. And the difficulty is, you know, there's all this talk about things like adaptive management, as if you see a change, if only you can make the change quickly enough, you can adapt to it. But one of the ways to think about this, and this is a complex system phenomenon, is the latency of feedback loops, right? And so if some change has happened that you can adjust to quickly, that's one thing. If something is happening, you cannot adjust too quickly because it'll take too long, you know, where the consequences are happening within months, but the only way to adjust to it is within years. That's another story. Now, the COVID example, I think, is an example where you can adjust to it quickly, and it would not surprise me. Uh, I'm assuming you're thinking of a real program, by the way. Uh, it would not surprise me if the people who ran that program program were able to pretty quickly adapt to the change. So the complex system behavior, which I haven't talked about, and I will in the future, is this notion that there's a very high probability that very low probability effects of consequence uh, are, are going to happen. Um, you could think of this in terms of sensitivity to conditions, but usually that's a situation where it didn't look consequential at the time, but it turned out to be whereas COVID definitely looks consequential immediately. Uh, so I don't know if I've answered that question, but I have added another complex system behavior. And in terms of planning, I don't know, the best I can say is that you want the program to be as flexible as possible with while keeping in mind what the program has to do. I mean, sometimes, for program to be successful, it cannot be flexible. Uh, and that has to do with things like internal linkages and the program itself is in an attractor, right? I mean, how quickly can you change a program? Well, if it's deep in an attractor, you're not gonna be able to change it so easily. So you could think of it in those terms. So I don't know about how well I've answered that question, but that's the best I got at the moment. No, that's great, thank you. Any other questions that have popped up? Or should I go on? I think we can go on and I'll, I'll keep track. Okay. Uh, we're actually doing all right here. Um, so I can go to the next. Oh, 
I don't want to stop sharing. Next slide, that will work, yes. All right, so if you remember, one of the things I said about the beginning and at the beginning is that although all this stuff might sound weird and counterintuitive or not weird, I've seen it all the time, but I don't know what to do about it, right? Which is maybe more likely considering that poll. The fact of the matter is that in terms of evaluation, we do know we can do this. Uh, and here I have an example. I made this up, this example, but I think it's a pretty good one. We have a healthy eating program, which basically is getting people to worry about their weight and their blood sugar and you know, their, their caloric intake and their vitamin balance and proteins that they consume and you know cutting down on processed foods, all the stuff you'd think you would teach in a healthy eating program. So in this program of mine, people are coming to training sessions on healthy eating. So we have the first attendee, the second attendee. That's a mistake. That should say and not to. And I keep telling myself I'm going to fix that. And I haven't. But the point is you're helping lots of people with physical health. But if you think about it, there are other things that might be happening as a result of helping with physical health, parenting, work activity, social functioning, psychological well-being, community involvement, all kinds of things can happen as a result of people being more physically healthy, even though that's not a stated goal of your healthy eating program. And you'll notice, by the way, that this is black and on top because that's the major goal of the program. These are all the other possibilities. And I put them in character string length because I don't know what's more important. Well, what can happen? <clears throat> well, each of these attendees have friends and family, right? Lots of them. And presumably, if you are healthier, your friends and family are going to see it. They're going to react to you differently. Uh, they might involve you in different kinds of, of activities. And they themselves might decide, gee, I maybe should start eating better myself. Look at how well this person is doing and this person is doing. Right? So you have direct effects for each attendee on all these people. Right? These people themselves talk to each other. right? So you have all kinds of interactions going on here. Uh, presumably the attendees know each other, right? So this person might also be influencing this person. It's quite likely, right? We're in a group. They're teaching us about healthy eating. I encourage you, you encourage me. You have some kind of a synergistic effect going on. What's also true is here we have this funny looking circle, uh, which I put to mean community. And I purposely didn't make that a clean circle or a clean uh, square because I wanted to connote the idea that these things are fuzzy. But the point is everything that's going on here can affect the community. And it's quite likely. That gives us, I'm just as an example, a bunch of people who are a lot healthier, they might be more active in parent teacher activities. They might be more active in civic society. Right? All these kinds of things can affect the community. So we have an emergent effect at the community level. And presumably, if the community is changing, the people running this program know that that's true, and they're going to hopefully uh, make some adjustments. So without defining a complex system, which I have great trouble doing, I have to tell you, and any definition I have, someone will come up with something else. But the point is, I think we can all look at this intuitively and say, this is a complex system. Well, if you were evaluating this, what would you do? Well, we know what kind of methodologies to use. Here are a bunch of examples, right? Process tracing, contribution analysis. You can monitor the program. You can do content analysis of social media. Uh, you can do comparisons with other communities, all kinds of interviews and observations. There's nothing here that we don't know how to do, right? What would you measure? Well, at the group and person level, right? I said there are influence on friends. That's measurable, right? It might not be quantitatively measurable, or it could be, but certainly qualitatively it could be observed. You could look at programming changes, right? We already said we have this feedback loop. Well, have these folks change what they're doing. Community level changes. Uh, do new programs show up in the community, right? Do existing programs disappear, right? There are all kinds of things that one could look at in terms of the individuals at the com or the community. And again, there's nothing here that we don't know how to observe, right? Here are the methodologies, right? And we could look at this if we wanted to, 
All right. What to measure? There's a, what's also a network view here. This really has to do with entities. This is the nature of the network. Well, the new edges appear, the new nodes appear, right? Do old relationships go away? Um, do existing uh, entities, nodes show up in, in, in show up or not? Uh, and this is also something that these methodologies will tell us, right? If we're doing a decent job of observing community behavior, these kinds of network uh, phenomena are things that we can see. And, and what about the data? <clears throat> well, we have records review. We can monitor our program activity. We can do content analysis of social media. We can interview people. We can observe people, right? So there's nothing here that we don't know how to do. So yes, we have a complex system. And if you wanna go back and think about stigma G and self-organization and, and emergence, all of those complex system behaviors can be observed, right? What? Okay, let me, can I go back? Let's let me do this. Hang on a minute. Previous. Let's stick to this one, right? All of these phenomena, right? All of these phenomena, which are important in their own right and which affect pattern and they affect predictability and they affect change happens. You can think of these as sort of intellectual structures that we would want to observe in this system because those intellectual structures help us understand and explain what is happening in this system that's called doing evaluation. And if we do these things, there is nothing exotic about this, right? None of, we might not, each of us be personally expert in all of these methodologies, but we've heard of them and we know how to find experts, right? If you might say, gee, I really have never done an outcome harvesting study, uh, but I've heard of it, I kind of understand what it is. Maybe I should do it. None of us would have trouble finding an expert in doing that. In the evaluation community, you can find that. It's not like Bayesian statistics where it'd be hard to find an expert. Right? Either we're familiar with the methodologies, or we know how to do it, or we can find people that we're comfortable with and we trust who can do it. What to measure? There's nothing exotic here. Even the network view, right? This network view is basically saying, what are these connections here? And if we and we can observe that. I'm not arguing that we can do this in some quantitative way, although often we can. Uh, we can certainly do it in a qualitative way as well. And there's nothing exotic or difficult. Data might be difficult to get, but there's nothing exotic about any of the data that we need. So what I would like to convince you of is that those complex system behaviors that help us explain pattern and predictability and how change happens and which are themselves useful can help explain the data that we have here and that we have a way to do it. Uh, think about stigma G, for instance, right? I mean, supposing a small group of these attendees begin by themselves to uh, talk to each other as we see here and decide therefore, gee, maybe, maybe it's a good idea to set up a uh, self-help group in sort of helping our kids do their homework. It's not inconceivable that people in a healthy eating program and who are interacting with each other a lot might come to a decision like that just because they're talking to each other. Well, if you think about the stigmergic behavior, other people see them. It's like, gee, not such a bad idea. Maybe we should do that as well. All right? Some other group comes along and says, looks pretty good to me. Maybe I should do that too. And then all of a sudden, one of the effects we have are um, groups that are helping students do their homework. The outsider, right, the uh, anthropologist from Mars would look at that and say, that must have been planned. Look what happened when, in fact, it was stigmatic behavior. It sort of happened by itself. So that would be a good example. Uh, it's an, also a pretty good example of emergence, right? Um, what is the value of doing all this homework assistance? You can't explain that in terms of the inputs that went into it. You have to measure it in its own right. So we have those examples. Are there questions or should I go on? How are we doing here? There's 
Um, one question which I think is useful at this point, um, which is, you know, as we're, as these concepts are becoming unpacked, just from a, a human psychology perspective, um, is there a risk that there is indecision from us as evaluators? Because as we start to understand and recognize how complex systems might be, we become overwhelmed. Um, and then we we don't act appropriately. Or or do you, in your experience in doing these sorts of trainings, by having these tools, we actually are better equipped um, to really- well, see sure. Well, that's my hope. Maybe my fantasy, but that's my hope. Uh, and the example I can give, uh, I love to think about, I don't claim to be a great statistician. I'm not but I understand statistics pretty well, right? And if you think about statistics, everybody gets confused in introductory statistics, right? But eventually you learn the language. And when you learn the language, two things happen. One thing is you might be able to apply statistics as in, are these groups different? Has there been change over time? All the things statisticians do. But even if you're not very good at figuring out how to run a regression analysis, it changes the way you think about how the world works, right? Uh, it's, you know, if, if you think about the example of the difference between I'm um, using statistics to evaluate, uh, to, to uh, analyze my data, or I'm using um, logistic regression to measure mean time between accidents in my railroad accident reduction program. If I, even if you don't use logistic regression, you know what statistical thinking is all about. You understand that I can analyze this phenomena by thinking in terms of sampling, right? Small samples aren't as good as big samples, right? That I can, in fact, make a probability statement about whether two groups are different or not, right? 5%, 1%, 7%, it doesn't matter what, you know, what your type one error rates are, but the idea that you can do such a thing, uh, that I have a confidence interval. You might not be able to calculate all that stuff, but it helps you understand what the phenom how the phenomena you're measuring is behaving. Right? And it takes a while to do that. But on the one hand, you might end up a statistician and you can run that logistic regression. But even if you're not, when the statistician says to you, I have found the mean time between incidents is changing, uh, which has happened to me, by the way. It's kind of work I've often done. The non-statistical expert can say, ah, he made a probability estimate uh, of whether or not there's a difference or not. Uh, he seems to know what he's doing, so he must have had enough uh, entities in his group to make a statement. He might not understand anything about power analysis, but he knows enough to ask me, is your sample big enough, right? And so there's a way of using either knowledge of statistics in an instrumental way or knowledge of statistics in a conceptual way to be better at what you're doing, which is understanding as the number of accidents in your train system decreased in, in my case. And that is the way I think about um, complex system behavior. Um, whether you can apply it in a technical way or not, you know, can you really figure out the shape of that attractor as an example, uh, is one thing. The other thing is to understand that there are attractors and that the shape of the attractors and the depth of the attractors can help explain both resistance to change and sustainability. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, but as I like to say, it's the best I got. No, I think in at this point in our journey, and, and for me as a learner with everyone, I think this is very helpful. Thank you. Okay, let us now go on. We're doing very well here, actually. Uh, yes, my class exercise here. Here you see my healthy eating program. I just sort of reproduced it as a small picture because I didn't think that people would actually remember that entire picture. By the way, one of these days, that too is going to change to an end because uh, what I mean to apply is that there are lots of attendees and I, I just always forget to do that. But in any case, 
What I'd like people to do before we do the poll is to start thinking about something, right? Which is to sketch a scenario that's relevant to your work, right? I mean, the example of uh, in-home help to new mothers is actually not that far from this example in a lot of ways. But begin to think about some of your programs that you're either designing or evaluating, right? And then pick some of these categories below, what to measure, methodologies, data, uh, network view, what to measure. Uh, and the question is, within each or any of these categories, can you identify some items that are relevant to doing this? Uh, and again, we're not going to have a long conversation about this. If people are willing to contribute in the chat, that would be great. But let us at least conduct a poll on the subject. So the... The poll guru needs to activate the poll. There we go. How confident are you that you have the skills or could easily access the skills needed to evaluate a complex system? And that easily access is important because we don't expect everybody to actually know this. This is so it looks like the data are stabilized here. Uh, I choose to take this as good news. <laughs> if people want to take it as bad news, that's okay too. Uh, but I'm not surprised. Well, actually, I take it back. I consider this bad news. And the reason is that we've already talked about, oh, can I go back? Well, never, well, I don't need to. What I've tried to do is to convince you that we know how to do this, right? Um, that we know what to measure, that we know what methodologies to use. Uh, of course, what I'm hoping is that you would apply the intellectual concepts of complexity to the interpretation of data and to the models you're developing, to the methodologies. But I did try to convince you that everything in these boxes are things that we know how to do. So I take it back. I was going to call this good news because everyone was somewhat confident, but I was hoping we'd have more people who were very confident. Uh, but in any case, are there questions that I should be addressing at this point based on this exercise, or should we go on? Um, I think we can go on. And okay. I'm collecting the questions for towards the end. That sounds great. So as I said, it does not surprise me. If, if people are telling me that I have difficulty in understanding how concepts like emergence and stigma gene and attractors and so on would apply here, I'm fine with that, right? If you already had intimate understanding of how to do that, there'd be no need for me to give this presentation. Uh, but if what you are telling me is that these data sources uh, and these methodologies are things that you would have trouble doing or easily having other people do, that's, that seems a bit problematic to me because it means I haven't explained things very well. So we'll talk about that. Okay, going on to the next slide. Oh, can we make this poll thing go away? Oh, there we go. Uh, we're going to get into two slides here about whether you want to involve, whether you want to invoke complexity concepts or not. Uh, and if you remember, one of the things I said at the very beginning of this talk uh, is that it often makes sense not to. Uh, and here we have an example. What I said is here's a network, right? And if I really did this right, and we'll see this later, and it has some kind of program input into here, and we'd have some kind of an output here, and this would be some kind of sort of a logic model in between. Um, and, and I have an example of that later, actually. But the point is this. If you said to me, 
Could I understand the relationship between element six and element three without using any of this fancy complex system stuff? Um, I would say, yeah, do I need to invoke complexity? Probably not. If someone came to me and said, yeah, but look at the environment, look at the context, you never know what's going on, sure. But if you said, could I design an evaluation, a little experiment to look at the difference between six and three, I'd be pretty comfortable not dealing much with complexity. Uh, if you look at six and three and four and eight, where right, I've sort of expanded the range here, and you said to me, well, I don't need any of these complexity concepts. I don't need to worry about sensitive dependence. I don't need to worry about emergence. I can do this the old fashioned way. Depending on my mood, you may or may not be able to convince me that that would be okay. But if you said to me, can I understand this whole set of relationships without thinking about complex behavior that you could not convince me of? All right, so the point is that the, that the distance essentially, or that the directness of the relationships or the immediacy of the relationships between the elements that you want to assess has a lot to do with whether or not it makes sense to ignore all this complex system stuff. So that is one issue related to, do I really need to invoke complexity? And if you remember when I said at the beginning, you can often make a good case that you don't need to involve complexity. Here's an example, and the truth is that as for much as evaluators these days like to talk about systems and wicked problems and environments and all that stuff, a lot of the stuff we evaluate, you know, kind of looks like that, which is okay. Here's another example <clears throat> I wanted to use. Uh, I'll explain this and then we'll do our little online poll. On the left, we have a traditional if-then model. And I'd love to give you a lecture at length on what the problems are with this, just as an example. Are these and relationships or are they or relationships? If these are and relationships, this provide education is not going to happen because what you're saying is this and this and this have to happen before we get that. Right? If these are or relationships, there's a pretty good probability that you'll be able to provide education. But in any case, right, we build schools, we hire teachers, right, we train them, uh, outreach to students to get them to school, we provide education, we have this outcome, 80% of the population has a functional eighth grade education. Pretty straightforward. Right? We've taken this exact same program and put it in a, and, and we said to ourselves, wait a minute, this is way too clean. This really is a complex system. And you, Sure enough, that's true. And if you look at all of these um, dotted lines here, we have feedback loops we haven't dealt with. We have the entire community that we haven't dealt with, right? Uh, what could be going on in the community? Well, community leaders increased their support for education. Might not have been something you expected, but, but it can happen. The economy crashes, people can't afford school fees, right? And of course, you have much else, right? Because environments are complicated, right? And so here's the complex system model here. And it's true, we've forgotten about all these feedback loops and feedback loops, by the way, can result in things like emergent behavior, state changes, all kinds of stuff like that, which I don't have time to explain in detail, but trust me, it can happen. We have all these uh, unanticipated kinds of things in the community. Uh, community leaders belief in education, the economy, who knows what else is going on. So if someone looked at this and said to me, but isn't this really a complex system? Isn't this really the appropriate model? I would say, yes, of course that's true. But now we're gonna talk about, should we evaluate relative to this model or relative to this model? Uh, the bottom line question here, by, conclusion here, by the way, is yes. In other words, you could convince me either way. Uh, but the issue is, what are the matters to consider? <clears throat> well, is the environment considered? Well, the traditional model, the answer is no, right? In the complex model, obviously the answer is yes. Can the cost easily be accommodated? Well, yeah, this is a pretty clean model. Here, the answer might be nothing of all the extra data that you would need to collect 
both qualitative and quantitative, to make this work. Um, our growth patterns recognize sort of uh, change over time, which we think is an important question. Well, the answer here is no. The answer here is yes. Uh, are the data requirements manageable? Well, they are here, but there's an awful lot of data we're going to be collecting here. Might not be so easy. Uh, can you explain it to your customers? Well, you can do it here. Trying to explain how this complex behavior works, I'd like to think that we all know how to do that and that we all could do it, but of course it wouldn't be so easy. Are important elements and connections missing? Well, I would argue that the answer is no here. Uh, yes, here, no, and no. Uh, high percentage of actionable information. I might be willing to argue that if I did this evaluation, that I could tell you something that would give you practical guidance as to what to do. Here, not so much, I don't think. So now you would look at this pattern and say, okay, what should I do here? Uh, and my point is that either of these decisions is defensible. Uh, and if someone came to me and said, I'm not gonna worry about complex system behavior, I'm just gonna use the old traditional evaluation methodologies to look at this, I'd say, fine, I get that. I believe that's a good decision. If someone came to me and said, yeah, but I really have a need to explain to my stakeholders how the world actually works, what is actually happening here, and therefore I wanna go the extra trouble and expense of doing this, I'd say, that's okay too. My only uh, message to you here though, is that one can make a defensible case for not invoking all this complexity stuff. Uh, although, okay, so we have a poll to conduct. So the poll conducting guru needs to hear me on what we have to hang on a minute. How often can you get good enough knowledge while ignoring the consequences of complexity? Think about your own worlds here. We're talking about the worlds you live in, and we're talking about what it is that I've told you about the behavior of complex systems and understanding pattern and predictability and so on. Well, that's pretty interesting. Well, I'll tell you, I'm surprised about the almost always. Uh, it's only about 12, 13%. But I would have expect personally, I would have expected that to be lower. But data are data, as they say. Uh, I'm heartened by the sometimes because I believe that's true. I mean, as much as I love to get people to think about complex systems and complex behaviors, I actually think that you're better off doing straightforward evaluation and saying something useful to the people that have to make practical decisions. Uh, and again, my view of evaluation is not to help people get the best answer. Personally, I think the reason to do evaluation is to help people make pretty good decisions and avoid the awful ones. Uh, that's just me, but that's how I look at things. And so sometimes it's okay. Never is probably a function of what kind of evaluation scenarios people are dealing with. Anyway, those are my thoughts about the results of the poll. Is there anything in the chat or in questions related to how people are relating to these results? Otherwise we can go on. Um, there's one question which I, I, I think you've, you've answered, but I would just love to just to have some clarification here. Sure. Is there a way to merge the traditional evaluation approach with a complexity evaluation approach? I mean, is it that we will dip our toes into both to try and get a little sure. bit more of an answer? The answer is yes. It's it's not all or nothing by any means. And I'll give you one of my favorite examples. Let's say if you think about all those complex system behaviors, they're not always operative. Right? All they are are sort of intellectual frameworks 
to decide whether you want to apply them or not. So you might look at all the complex system behaviors, plus the X one I'm going to add next time, right? The black swan effect stuff, right? And you might say, what really matters here is state change behavior. You know, my favorite example of that is innovation adoption, right? The famous S curve where you have um, very few people adopting the innovation. You have an inflection point. All, all of a sudden, is rapid growth, and then enough people in the population have the innovation that it that it uh, asymptotes out, right? It's, you know, Rogers S curve, all that. Uh, well, if I'm developing a program theory or a methodology. And I'm saying, look, one of the key things in this program of mine is whether other people are going to adopt this innovation or whether people are going to choose to avail themselves of the service that I am providing, right? Those are, um, those are innovation adoption kinds of dynamics and state change makes a sense, makes sense, whereas the others might not, okay? So... Uh, on the other hand, if you think about that state change behavior and you compare, this is an innovation example that I like to use. In world number one, the innovation is flat screen televisions. And in world number two, the innovation is access to the internet and sort of turning internet deserts into internet forests, okay. The pattern of adoption might be the But in the case of flat screen televisions, all you have are more flat screen televisions. In the case of um, the internet, you're going to have many emergent effects, right? Because once people begin to network with each other, it can change entire communities. Um, and so if you're looking at your phenomenon and saying flat screen televisions, the complex system of behavior I need to be cognizant of is uh, state change, but helping people connect to each other, yes, I need to deal with state change and yes, we're gonna have the same kind of S curve, but we're gonna have all kinds of emergent effects in the community as well. How do I know that? It's pro program theory, right? I know that connecting people can have profound effects. So in example number one, there's only one complex system behavior that makes sense. Uh, in example number two, there are two complex system behaviors that make sense. So, and what about all those other things I talked about? Probably not very important. So the idea is what are the intellectual uh, tools of complex systems and which ones do I think are relevant? So I don't know if that answers the question, but but I hope it does. It's like saying, do I need to always use everything I know about statistics to analyze my data? And the answer is no. Right? What you need to know is that you need to know enough statistics. I'm sorry, enough statistics to know how to choose, but you're not going to use everything. So I trust that's an acceptable answer. Thank okay. you. Can I? Make that go by, guys. Let's see where we're going. How are we doing on time? I think we're doing okay. Next slide. Ah, uh, well, we do have time a little bit to get into uh, in into transformation. Um, the reason I wanted to include this is because I'm reasonably sure that many of the people on this call are interested in a lot more than individual programs, right? But they're interested in transformational change. Uh, and if you're interested in transformational change, then you really do need to think about complex system behaviors. Because if there's any phenomenon in this world of ours where complex system behavior is going to have an effect, I shouldn't say that, is going to be operating, it's going to be in the world of transformation. So the first issue is, uh, as they used to teach me in graduate school, let's operationalize this, right? What does it mean to have transformation? Uh, well, here's one way that I've looked at this. I said, well, it has to be a geographical boundary, 
right? Because it's a reasonable proxy for the multiple, you know, for, for a lot of different things happening. So the idea is within a city, a country, a county or whatever, we're going to be looking at change, right? Sort of setting the boundaries because it's not just the geography, but lots happens in these communities. And so geographical boundary, pick your boundary. If it's a block in a city, I'd say probably not good enough. A neighborhood, maybe a city, probably, right? A country or province, almost certainly. Level of use. Here's the example, approximately 80, 80% is a reasonable approximation for the new equilibrium state. And again, what we're really saying is, well, what does sustainability mean in terms of transformation? I should have put sustainability up there on top as well. It means that there is a new attractor, there's a new equilibrium, there's a new new normal. Okay, uh, time, about five years. It's that's, I said, maybe that's an adequate amount of time to indicate that the change is going to endure. Culture, it's generally accepted that this new way of doing things is gonna happen, is gonna continue, right? It's a loose term that indicates sort of community support, social support and so on and so forth. Measurable but imprecise. Notice that I use words like about and approximate and general, right? Why did I do that to try to define uh, transformation? Uh, and the answer is that we want to avoid false precision. You really want to say 80% have to be using uh, green energy. Someone's going to call along and say, what about 75%? Maybe it doesn't count until it's 99%, right? So you want to avoid false precision. You don't know enough to define it in specific terms, right? And different combinations work. I mean, supposing it was 95%, but in a smaller geographical area. So the idea is that you need a definition of transformation that more or less works and is essentially sloppy. And it's my belief that that's the way to think about it. if I'm going to measure transformation, it's multidimensional uh, and it allows for a tremendous amount of variation in any given measure. But it doesn't mean you can dig out a table of random numbers and put this stuff in, right? You do need to give it some real thought. And you'll notice it's agnostic, right? This doesn't say we like the change or we don't like the change, right? I've been reading a lot of evaluation lately where people say that uh, equity and transformation are inextricably linked. And that's not true. At least I don't believe it's true, right? It doesn't say that the transformation is going to be a good thing or a bad thing. Right. That is for us to impose our values and then to try to develop transformation that will fulfill our values. But transformation itself, I don't know about you guys, but my view is the world always changes in ways that has transformed it, that, that I think are really bad new social conditions. So we set up a definition, and I think that you can't do anything without a good definition. Um, so now we have a little exercise. I'm going to conduct the poll, right? So I want you to think about some transformations relevant in your world, right? Geographical boundary X, what are the specifics? Approximately, what's the actual percentage of interest? Uh, maintain itself for five years for you, for your condition. Is it five minutes or is it 50 years, right? And then the new state of affairs is generally accepted. So it's Filter through your minds what a definition, definition of transformation would be for your world. Uh, and if what I'm really thinking about here is what's the transformation, what are the geographical boundaries, what's the level of use, and so on, all those criteria that we talked about, right? And what ranges would you accept? So if you're willing to put some of that in the chat, it would be great. But in the meantime, let's conduct a poll. Here's the poll who is. Can you think of a time when having knowledge about complex behavior would have been an important addition to your knowledge? Right, and again, we're talking about transformation here. Well, I'm glad everybody says yes. I've done some kind of a reasonable job of explaining all this. So as I said, in terms of 
transformation. I think that if you do, everybody talks about transformation. Uh, what makes me nervous is that they talk about it in very loose ways. Uh, and I think that although we can have tremendous ranges in the parameters, you can't talk about it in loose ways. You need to think about boundaries and, and how much use right, and what time frame, what does transformation actually mean? Because if we're evaluating these things, we need to be able to measure these things. Doesn't mean we need to be able to measure them with a high level of precision. It's one of my biggest problems in evaluation, by the way, is that I think people insist on, and this is true for qualitative work as well, they seem to insist on a lot more precision than I think they can possibly measure and a lot more precision than they can actually use for making practical decisions. Okay, so we could go on and talk a bit more about transformation, which I would like to, but before we do that, since we are beginning to run up to a deadline, should I answer questions at this point or should I continue with transformation? And I yield to the wisdom of the people running this workshop. Thanks, Jonathan. So we have about nine minutes or so left. Um, so I'd love to leave room for kind of key takeaways from what we've got through so far, but also just ask a couple of questions here. Um, if that's if if you feel that's okay at this point. It's certainly okay with me. I mean, my problem is push my on button and I'll never stop. But I know <laughs> enough to not push the on button. So I'll shut up for a while. No. Um, so, you know, as people are, are thinking about how to develop definitions, what tips do you have in terms of, as we're looking back to other modules that we've had and kind of how you engage partners in, in these kind of complex evaluations, how do you sort of, at what point in this program cycle would you start to sit down? Who would you sit down with to really come up with a meaningful um, set of definitions, set of boundaries for sure. transformation setting? Well, if it were me, I would do it at the very beginning when a program was in the glee, in the, a gleam in the eyes of the funders. Um, but the way I would do it is this, I think. I do depend how well I do them and if I had a relationship with them or not. But let's presume I don't know them very well at all. Okay. I would have them sketch out whatever program they wanted to sketch out. Right. And if you want to call that a logic model, you can do that. If you want to call it a storyboard, you can do it. You know, pick your favorite terms, pick your favorite methodologies for doing that. At which point I would then begin to ask them why they think that this is going to work the way it's going to work. And they are going to tell me, right? They all, they're going to tell me. I think what I would then do is begin to introduce some of these complex systems concepts. So I'd say, oh, you think that because of A, B, and C, you're going to get outcome D. And they're going to say, yeah, that's what we think. And then you're going to say, well, what is outcome D? And they'll tell you. And then you'll say, well, gee, you know, you've got A, B, and C. How come D looks so different than, than the A, B, and C uh, inputs to it, right? And all of a sudden, you're beginning to think about emergent behavior. You know, I might say to them, do you think that all of this is going to happen slowly or is it going to happen all at once, which is might be, and, and the, the first thing I'm going to say is, well, of course it's going to happen slowly, you know, there going to be intermediate changes. And then I would begin to give them some examples of state change behavior and say, well, maybe something like this is going on. Certainly anything involving innovation adoption would be a good example, but there are other examples as well. And they may say, oh yeah, you know, we do think there's going to be a sudden change. Um, you might say to them, how difficult do you think it's going to be to bring about this new state of affairs? And they'll give you an answer, but then you could introduce concepts of, well, what does this attractor look like? What does the state change look like? Um, 
gee, you really have control over what's going to happen. Well, obviously we do. And then they're going to start thinking about it and say, well, but you know, stuff happens that we don't have control over that things seem to build on themselves. So maybe we need to look at that as well. So what you're doing is a sort of adding in concepts from complex systems uh, and making it look, which it is, by the way, look like common sense. Gee, it really does make sense that things are going to happen all, you know, all together because they're all going to suddenly come together. Uh, so, you know, state change is not an exotic concept, but you've introduced it. Now, if I knew them well and I had brainwashed them and I knew all these concepts, right, then we might jump right into it. This is and, what I will do. <clears throat> and in your experience, how have, because this conversation and this example of a conversation that you have with your partners, with your funders, mm -hmm. is getting people to reflect, right, on the Correct. reality of what is the vision they want, and in our case, what's the vision they want for young children? Um, and, and in your experience, how have funders been on board with this sort of approach where you're saying it's, you know, perhaps we need to think more Perhaps in order to answer that question, in order to really understand where we are towards our vision of serving and supporting young children, this kind of transformational um, change is necessary to, to understand, to measure well, at some point, however whether, imprecisely. Whether it's transformational or not is a values question. That's not an evaluation question, right? I could easily see someone saying, you know, we want to get all the kids vaccinated. We want to get all the kids eating well. And the more kids eat well, the, the, the better the nutrition of the larger number of population of kids, the better we are. 100% is good, 90% is okay, 20% is bad. There's no transformation there. That's just, that's the flat screen TV example. Right. Uh, but what they might say is, well, if kids now all have good nutrition, you might then say, well, what else might happen? And they might begin to say, well, it's going to affect school and it's going to affect how their kids interact with each other. And all of a sudden, they're beginning to think about these uh, effects that are unpredictable. We don't know that these things are going to happen, but they may very well, at which point we have these emergent effects. So that's how I would do it. But I, I don't think that, I mean, in a way, I think the field of evaluation talks about transformation too much, honestly. Because if you, if you help a lot of people, that seems like an awfully good thing to me. So, so there is that. Great. Thank you. I think there's, um, what you shared has generated a lot of rich conversation and a lot of questions that I think people are going to continue to reflect on. Um, but I can see that we're approaching time. So I want we to are. hand over to Shikufe. Thank you, Johnny and Aisha. That was incredible. Um, Shira, since we only have a couple of minutes, do you want to quickly slide show so we can go through um, the next steps? But I think I think it's been such a rich session. Again, Johnny, thank you so much. And Aisha, thank you so much as well. Um, Guys, if you want to uh, get a certificate, complete the survey. I think that's been shared a lot. Um, next, sure, let's just keep going through it really quickly. Uh, the next session is starting in a half hour with Samia Alva, Emily Stammer, and Mark Tomlinson on complexity aware monitoring approaches for adaptive and context specific program improvement. So, hopefully, we can take some of the questions that have emerged here and continue the dialogue there in half an hour. Uh, please, and then tomorrow we're reaching the second last day of the series. It's so sad. Um, uh, but we have session 11 with Julia Kaufman and Align Mental Models and Approaches and Systems Change Efforts. Uh, and then with Cynthia Rayner on Principles and Practices of Systems Change Case Studies of System Work, Systems Work. Um, also, just a reminder, the Paydex Foundation has generally offered a resilient scale masterclass for anyone who wanted to join and that information is in the chat and it's also been shared out in the email as well. So just another opportunity in case you feel sad that the series is over.
And you're getting some great feedback in the chat, Johnny. I hope you're looking at that. Yeah, I am reading um, it. Wonderful. And as always, more information. Let's just keep going through it quickly. Um, uh, Ekdan website, chat on uh, connect.ekdan.org on ECD Connect. Big thank you to the Ekdan team as always. And thank you, everyone. See you in half an hour. Um, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Johnny and Aisha, for an incredible session. Have a great day. My pleasure. Thank you to everybody for listening to me.